thank you very much for everyone who um, already logged in. Uh, this is Satish Mediseri, President and CEO of uh, Renault Neural. To give a couple more minutes for other attendees who are going to join us, I would um, like to start with a brief uh, overview of uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, Renault Neural. Here's a short video. All right, that was a brief uh, introduction history um, of Renovo as well. And uh, we're two minutes after, so maybe we should start. Um, once again, thank you very much for everyone who joined us this afternoon. And uh, our you know, talk today will be how we can help uh, to move your multiple sclerosis pipeline with reliable and reproducible preclinical data. Of course, with the overall mission, uh, at Renovo is to help reinvent life for people with MS. What we really strive for is that eventually the models that we have developed and are developing at this point would eventually help the people with MS. In terms of a short agenda that we have today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about MS and then treatment strategies and various animal models that recapitulate features of MS and then talk a little bit more in depth about what these reliable and reproducible experimental readouts are and share some proof of concept studies that we have done. And I will also share some exciting data on, on an advanced technique, electron microscopy technique that we are using to generate new insight into mechanism of action. And finally, I will give a very brief uh, overview of in vivo live imaging techniques that are under development at Renovo as well. Certainly, please feel free to type in a question anytime during the talk, so don't hesitate and you don't have to wait till then to ask a question. All right, multiple sclerosis is an inflammatory disease that destroys myelin, oligodendrocytes, exons, and, and eventually results to reversible axonal damage in, in CNS. Now there's always, or still has, uh, is a debate whether or not MS is an immune disease or neurodegenerative disease. Now, you know, we are certainly not going to debate that in this um, talk today, but we're really the 
the way the easiest way to probably think about it is its early stages. It it's really shows itself as as an immune disorder more or less, and at the later stages of the disease, it becomes more neurodegenerative. So what we are going to try and and address with the various animal models that we are offering at Renova, we'll talk about how these models can address both the early stage and late stage targets of the disease and, and features of the disease. So that's really the goal for today. In terms of therapeutic strategies, you know, we all know immune modulation is, is very well established and a proven strategy to modify the course of the disease. In fact, all the drugs that are in the market right now are immunomodulators in one way or the other. However, they don't have a significant impact on, on progressive neural damage that is seen in this uh, disease. The other strategies that are discussed and, and published heavily uh, for MS is remyelination, a process where you generate new myelin uh, to sheath axons. So this is a very well characterized phenomenon and most extensive repair process in adult brain. It has been shown uh, to happen in MS brain tissues as well. It's, it's a very well validated neurorestorative strategy for uh, MS patients, again, based on um, the findings from uh, the tissues. Um, and then also neuroprotection. Talking about neuroprotection, it is a fairly, um, again, broad term. Uh, however, in MS, so with respect to MS, I think two, there are two different ways that people look at it. So number one, remyelination itself, by unsheathing the axon again, it will have a direct impact on limiting neural injury. In addition to that, protecting demyelinated axons is very critical to maintain the neural integrity as well. So we all know that the current standard of care for MS is immunomodulation. And of course, everybody sees uh, remyelination and our neuroprotection as a potential next frontier for MS treatment. So talking about animal models that recapitulate MS pathology. So we at Renovo primarily offer two different models. One is EAE. I mean, everybody knows about this model. It's been around for several years, several decades, actually. Uh, this is a model where peripheral immune cells invade and cause demyelination in spinal cord. So that's the primary pathology that we see in this model. And then we also have a cuprizone-based model. So cuprizone is a toxin that results in demyelination in both white and gray matter regions in the brain. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these two models and, and uh, what we have uh, been able to achieve with these models uh, at Renovo. So uh, again, there are uh, other models as well, but these are the models that we've been concentrating quite a bit. So what we have in this table on the left-hand side here are the experimental readouts that are relevant to various features of MS. So certainly behavioral changes is what is seen in MS patients. And then all the histological changes that are reported here are something that has been reported from MS tissues in the literature. So our intent was to uh, see how these two models, Cuprizone and EAE model, will be able to address these various features. Obviously, there is no single perfect model out there. But the, way to, the best way to look at these models is which one is going to help address what features that are relevant to the human disease. So in terms of behavioral changes, um, we, we see motor deficits, sensory deficits, and cognitive deficits in, in both models. However, I have to say that uh, in the EAE model, these deficits are very clear, very pronounced. Um, you know, the animals have uh, you know, significant paralysis. You know, there is a nice um, uh, way of scoring these animals in terms of their motor deficit, sensory deficit, and there are also some cognitive uh, you know, tests that are uh, you know, published. And in cuprizone model, these behavioral changes are not very pronounced. I mean, they're very subtle, and uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not very well established yet, although we do have data to suggest that some of the, some of the tests can be used to uh, evaluate drugs. But I, I just want to make sure that, that this model, to clarify that this model, well, in cuprizone model, we don't see very pronounced behavioral deficits. Histological changes. Obviously, looking at adaptive immunity is very important uh, in terms of this disease model. Uh, EAE model, it's very clear that there is uh, infiltration of peripheral immune cells into uh, spinal cord. Uh, however, we have not tested that 
very much in the Kupi Zone model. And uh, in fact, we do believe that there is not a lot of peripheral cell Im infiltration. I mean, there may be some, but not a lot. I mean, nothing really uh, close to what we see in the EAE model. In terms of activation of innate immunity, uh, what we see is activation of microglia uh, in, in both the models. So going down the list, you know, demyelination in corpus callosum, which is white matter, cortex and hippocampus, that's the gray matter. We see that very clearly in, in the Cooper zone model. However, in the AE model, it's a pretty big challenge. We often don't see pathology in the brain, but we haven't really spent a lot of time looking at brain in the AE model. Spinal cord demyelination, we don't see anything in the Cooper zone model. Uh, we don't spend much time on spinal cord in the Cooper zone model, but the AE model is very good to evaluate spinal cord tissues. Axonal injury. To look at axonal transaction and axonal injury, I would say Cooper zone is, is, is the best model. Uh, again, it's not very easy to evaluate that in the AE model. Uh, looking at oligodendrocyte dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, again, we have data at this point to suggest that Cooper zone is a better suited model than the EAE model. Uh, so this is basically an overview of, of the different features of the model. I'll be showing the data for various features, but this will give you a very global view of, of what these models are and what they can show. All right, looks like I have a question here. question is, um, do we offer uh, other models such as a lysolecithin model? So the answer is no, we don't offer the lysolecithin model right now. However, we have tried. So when we were uh, trying to find a model uh, to set up an assay for demyelination and remyelination, uh, we tried lysolecithin. The challenge there is having a a standardized model which is highly reproducible. Uh, I mean, bottom line, we weren't able to reproduce the lysolecithin lesions as well as we could do with cuprizone. I mean, with cuprizone, we have such big lesions and in white matter and gray matter, so it just becomes much easier. Also, we've, we've tried other models. Um, uh, number one, I think we looked at uh, transgenic um, in a strain of, of mouse to uh, evaluate EAE in that mouse to see if we can uh, develop progressive lesions. Uh, again, it was not very robust, um, and now we are, we are also working with a potential client where we're going to develop, you know, hopefully, a mock protein um, in UCA instead of mock peptide. And in-house, Renovo is also developing um, a cuprizone-based progressive model as well. If there's time, I can probably discuss a little bit more about that towards the end. So yes, we have. Uh, or have been looking into other models uh, to, again, bring in more features of the disease. Uh, so Cooperson model at, at Renovo, uh, we have a slightly modified version than historical model. So the data here shows uh, the control, which is the naive animal, um, and then setting that as 100% myelin, let's assume. So this data is from corpus callosum, uh, just looking at the myelin levels. So if we, we use cuprizone only, and this is cuprizone has been around for several years, um, if we treat the animals for six weeks, we still see approximately 50% of the myelin, and that's primarily because what's happening in cuprizone model is there is spontaneous remyelination during the demyelination phase. Uh, so that's why you know we see more myelin still. But if we use cuprizone and rapamycin, so the CR stands for cuprizone and rapamycin. So we also inject the animals with rapamycin, which is an mTOR inhibitor. By inhibiting that, we uh, stop the differentiation of OPCs into oligodendrocytes and thereby stop spontaneous remyelination during demyelination. So that's why we are able to keep the myelin level to almost nothing compared to the naive animal. So we have two different models, acute six weeks, chronic 12 weeks. In both models, I, I think cuprizone and rapamycin, it, it, the baseline is very low and very consistent. We work with cuprizone only as well, but again, the baseline is not very clean. So all the data I'm going to show you today is with cuprizone and rapamycin. So talking about reliable and reproducible readouts in this model. Histological assessment of myelin and white matter. Now, this is of paramount importance for everybody who's working in, in this disease. Appropriate histology techniques to generate reliable results is very, very important. Staining with lipophilic dyes and antibodies against myelin in white matter tissues in thicker sections is going to be 
highly variable and unreliable because you know white matter is basically you have uh, um, a stack of axons together and then thicker sections are not going to be helpful. And consistent region of interest is very, very important and critical to achieve the producible results. So at Renovo, we do EPON embedding and only work on semi-thin one micron sections to quantify individual myelinated axons for accurate assessment of myelin in corpus callosum. And here's why. So if you look at this image here, this is an image of a cross-section of corpus callosum, one micron section from an EPON embedded tissue. So this three weeks of remyelination after 12 weeks of demyelination. So you really see a lot of nice myelinated axons. This is staining by PPD, the lipophilic dye which stains myelin. A lot of nice, you know, little donuts that you can see as myelinated axons. However, there's also a lot of myelin debris which is shown by red arrows here. So you can differentiate between myelinated axons and the debris in these thin, really thin axon uh, sections However, it's not possible if you're working with 30 micron or 20 micron sections and you're doing lipophilic dyes or even PLP antibodies won't help because you'll be evaluating the myelin as both healthy myelin as well as um, this dyeing or, or myelin debris. So you really need one micron sections to evaluate and, and have a very reliable output. Now the next slide here, slide 12, shows how important is the region of interest. So on the right side here, you see our regular region of interest. That's the where you can see myelinated axons as well as debris. And when we count axons in this region of interest, we counted 344. Now in the same section, the same tissue, if you go 100 micron rostral and take another region of interest, now your axon count one three times higher. Now it's, it's a known truth, it's been published, that corpus callosum is affected uh, in, in different ways um, at different levels by cuprisone. So now the whole, so the whole corpus callosum will not demyelinate. It's just very, the demyelination is different in various regions. So that's why it's extremely important to be in the same region, every animal, every group. And other feature of, of the model should, should you know, recapitulate in the actual disease. So we should be able to demyelinate as well as show some spontaneous remyelination which is seen in, in MS as well. So here on the top left you see control, the normal tissue, nice uh, PPD with the uh, uh, pack with myelinated axons. They're coming back. You can see a few of those donuts, 12 plus 3 more, and 12 plus 6 even more. So this model demonstrates spontaneous remyelination in corpus callosum, very similar to uh, what's seen in the human tissue. Uh, however, when we are evaluating drugs, obviously we need to be able to uh, modulate that and then show that the drug can potentially induce over um, spontaneous remyelination. I'll, I'll show some data. Now, talking more about the readouts. Now, we talked about white matter. Now, histological assessment in gray matter. Now, it's, it's a tissue of great interest now in MS. Uh, looking at hippocampus, cortex. Again, here, staining with lipophilic dyes uh, will result in false positives, negatives. I'll show you some data. And obviously, good antibodies and consistent region of interest are very important. Here at Renovo, we always use PLP, you know, sustaining to quantify myelin in cortex and hippocampus. So slide number 15 shows the top panel is staining with black gold. It's a lipophilic dye, and bottom panel is PLP. So if you see the left uh, images here on the top is a cross section which has been stained by black gold, and uh, the arrow here points to a region which shows as a negative with black gold. And when we take the adjacent section and stain with PLP, clearly there is a lot more uh, myelin there than what is shown in, in black gold. On the other hand, if you go to a different level in the same brain, here it's hippocampus, you look at where the arrow is pointing in black gold staining, it looks like there's myelin there. But you look at PLP immunostaining, there is no myelin or very less myelin. So false positives, false negatives. So with this model, we can definitely create very consistent lesions. So this is actually two halves of different brains, just so that you know. So the left side is a half of the brain section of a naive animal, not treated with cuprisone. And on the right-hand side is, is cuprisone and rapamycin. So look at the hippocampus. It's very clearly demyelinated after 12 weeks, 
And similarly, there is this lateral uh, um, area of cortex that is consistently demyelinated. So we know what these areas are, where to go, and then consistently look at the same regions. And the antibody works fantastic. Um, again, like white matter, in the gray matter also, we should be able to see the spontaneous demyelination. Um, on the leftmost image here, you see a naive animal cortex staining with the PLP. Good. 12 weeks um, of demyelination, almost no myelin. You see these little cells here. These are premyelinating oligodendrocytes. So the oligodendrocytes stay in but they're not myelinating yet. This is a premyelinating stage. And this is also has been reported in uh, uh, human MS tissue. So around demyelination areas, you see these premyelinating oligodendrocytes. So at, at one week after, three weeks after, six weeks after, you can see the myelin coming back up. So there is spontaneous remyelination in the tissue. So again, remyelination dynamics are important. So when we look at how spontaneous remyelination happens in this model, uh, the, the top line here is cortex, so after 12 weeks of demyelination, it goes down to almost 20% of normal, it, it comes back to 80% in six weeks. Um, in hippocampus, almost 10-5% uh, or so, it comes back to uh, close to 50%. However, in corpus callosum, it goes down to less than 5%, but at six weeks, it's still under 20 or a little around 20%. Now, this is important, why the rate of re Pollination is less in white matter than gray matter. Again, this is what has been reported in MS tissues as well. So the targets are different. We know that. And uh, again, this will allow us to also identify the windows where we can actually test the drug. For example, if your drug is having an impact on cortex, we obviously don't want to look at 12 plus 6 because the spontaneous demyelination is already at 80%. So there's not a good window to, to test. All right, so proof of concept with this model. So we use thyroid hormone. And there's literature out there which says that thyroid hormone differentiates oligodendrocyte precursor cells into oligodendrocytes and, and also promotes remyelination. So these images here on the left side are DMSO and the right side treated with T3. So these OPCs are actually expressing EGFP through PLP promoter. So as the cells are differentiating due to T3 treatment, the cells are expressing PLP, through which they're also expressing GFP. So this work has been done at Renovo. We have a cell-based screening platform to do this. So clearly in vitro, T3 in our hands demonstrates OPC differentiation. And uh, we tested T3 in the 12-week animal model. We treated the animal for six weeks, uh, daily administration, IP. And here looking at cortex and hippocampus, so vehicle versus T3 treated in the red bar here. So clearly T3 um, promotes remyelination compared to vehicle uh, and in a significant manner in both cortex as well as hippocampus in this case. So the next slide here shows the effect of T3 on white matter, corpus callosum remyelination. Again, it's, it's the same. So in, in the control animal, um, uh, the, the number of myelinated axons you can see per unit area and then T3 significantly increases uh, the number of myelinated axons in this model. So basically what I showed in the last couple slides is that, that with T3 we were able to demonstrate that this model is amenable to test drugs. And we've done T3 studies at least three different times, so we know uh, it's, it's consistent. And continuing about more readouts on Cooper's own model looking at axonal degeneration in white matter, corpus callosum. Now here, again, a very good antibody and consistent region of interest is important. We use SMI32 to do immunostaining uh, to identify axonal ovoids. So image on slide 23 shows a cross-section of um, corpus callosum. And uh, you can see these little ovoids that are attached to an axon. Now this, is, this image is very similar to what was published by Bruce Trapp in New England Journal of Medicine in 1998. It's, a, it's one of the very uh, highly cited papers in, in MS um, research that you know, showing these axonal ovoids in human uh, MS tissue. So we see very similar um, ovoids in coprizone treated tissues, and we can quantify uh, the number of ovoids. And obviously, the next step is once we know that this is uh, doable, 
to do a proof of concept study. So we don't know if there is, uh, well, I mean, there is no established or no neuroprotective agent um, out there, at least, you know, for in MS models. And uh, so we didn't have a way to test a compound. But what we did was we worked with the syntophilin knockout mice. So these are transgenic mice which have mitochondrial abnormalities that predispose them to increase that bone degeneration. And this is a collaboration with Tramp Lab. This paper is actually now um, published online in PNAS. I'll be happy to provide more information. But basically, the concept here was what happens if we treat synapto, uh, synthophilin knockout mice with 2 p napomycin? Our hypothesis would be the number of axonal ovoids will go up. So that's exactly what happened. So the next image, and in uh, slide 25, the wild type on your left, you can clearly see all these axonal ovoids in corpus callosum, and then you can you know, definitely see more in, in these knockout mice. And when we quantify, uh, you know, there's a significant increase in these knockout mice to show uh, increased number of axonal ovoids as well. So uh, again, this model is certainly amenable to evaluate the changes in the number of axonal ovoids uh, in this particular model. And as I said, this data has been published. I'll be happy to provide uh, the reference as well. All right, so now talking about the EAE um, model a little bit more. Uh, it's a very standard uh, MOG model. Um, it's been used by MOG peptide. And uh, the experimental endpoints include clinical paralysis scoring. Everybody knows about this. And we also have several histological endpoints, and uh, you know, such as lesion load and uh, myelinated axon quantification. And we can also do CD electron microscopy here. Um, very quick, so there is a question here about, well, so we are talking about EAE model, but the question is about Cuprizone model. Have we tested any existing or current market, uh, marketed drugs in uh, the Cuprizone model? Um, so yes, we have tested multiple of those. Unfortunately, I cannot share um, all that data because it's with clients. But one thing that I can speak about is um, uh, data that has been published by Biogen uh, through a poster. Uh, we retested BG12 in, in the Cuprizone neuroprotection model. So BG12 uh, has shown to decrease the number of axonal ovoids in that model. Uh, again, this is an abstract and a poster that was uh, discussed at ECTRIMS. And um, if anybody needs more information, I'll be happy to provide. Uh, we are currently uh, doing more experiments to understand how, um, if the BG12 is, is promoting that uh, change in axonal ovoids. Again, continuing with the uh, EAE model, uh, some data. We used uh, dexamethasone for proof of concept study. A lot of literature suggests that it's immunosuppressant. So the data here shows when we inject animals with dexamethasone when they're induced with EAE, what we see is the control animals, the regular injected animals, have a peak score of, of 3. And then the disease severity it goes down to the normal trend. But you can see dexamethasone animals, the severity of disease is significantly less. Number one, their peak score is significantly less. And even the course through the course of the disease over 30 days, significantly less disease severity compared to Waco. Again, this data, again, you will find in literature very well. But again, this shows that this is something that we can do in-house, and we have done it. Um, in terms of uh, lesion load analysis, again, semi-thin sections are our favorite when it comes down to looking at myelin in white matter. Uh, what this image shows is, is a cross-section, uh, one micron section, the spinal cord. And we can outline the areas. Uh, this is a tall blue staining. Outline the areas which show demyelination very clearly. and. Um, we can quantify the lesion load based on that. Again, we all know that the lesion load is highly variable in, in various labs, various models. Um, that poses a challenge in terms of uh, quantifying myelin. So what we believe is it's important to establish the lesion load first if we are trying to um, uh, estimate the number of myelinated axons or, or quantify the myelinated axons between vehicle and treated in EAE models. So the, the first thing that we do is we have to match up the lesion loads very well. And then, of course, do PPD staining and uh, 66X imaging. Again, uh, what we do is we crop out the area where it's demyelinated. You can see that in the inset. Again, beautifully stained uh, myelinated axons 
here, you can clearly see the debris as well, all these blobs. Again, this is why it's important to go with this semi-thin section PPD staining countermyelinated actons. Uh, if you go with thicker sections, my, uh, staining with antibodies, the data will be highly variable, not reliable. All right, so in addition to the myelin readouts and, and axonal degeneration readouts that I show you, we can also do several other things. You can quantify specific cell types, such as oligodendrocytes, OPCs, microglia, astrocytes, and so many other things. This is just an example of um, uh, one of the cell types, the GST pi is used to identify mature oligodendrocytes. So this is an area in the cortex here. Again, beautiful staining. It's very easy to uh, identify. And then we have uh, automated algorithms to quantify um, uh, in all these changes. Uh, we, we try to automate as much as possible. Again, the, the whole setup is to help drug development and then identify changes. So automation is absolutely important and helpful there. All right, so now going into the next phase, uh, talking a little bit more about this advanced technique I mentioned, 3D electron microscopy. Uh, electron microscopy historically has been used to generate uh, great images, nice videos, never have been used uh, for really large studies to test any uh, drug induced changes, but that's really our goal. That's where we want to go. In fact, we are using 3D electron microscopy uh, in some drug studies that we're doing right now. So the big difference is by using this technology where we actually stain a whole tissue block with heavy metal and put it in the electron microscope system that we have, which has an automated microtome to keep slicing and imaging. Um, and then by that um, mechanism, basically overnight, we can generate 300 to 500 slices or images at nanoscale, which we can then put together and then generate the data out. So the, the stack here is obviously just a little bit more animated than what it looks like, but the idea is we can generate these stacks overnight and, and have 3D images of these axons. And this can then be used to evaluate or confirm remyelination. Myelin thickness and internodal length are the best way to confirmation, confirm remyelination, which is uh, that this is a new myelin but not the old myelin. Uh, again, neuroprotection, we can do a lot of things. Quantifying unmyelinated axons can only be done by this way, axonal ultrastructural integrity. We do a lot of work with mitochondrial changes and, and synaptic changes as well. I'll show you a little bit of data here. Uh, this is a video which um, uh, the intent of this video is to show how we track individual axons and, and re reconstruct them to be able to generate the data. Uh, so keep an eye here, follow the pointer. There's going to be a box coming up, the red box. So this is the axon. This is the node of round VA. This is the axon that you're tracing. I'll also follow the red um, uh, dot here. So this is an axon, that myelinated axon that you're tracing. Again, here, this is the other side of the node of round VA for the same axon. So now we captured both the nodes um, here. I'm going to quickly run this again just so that you can see it. This data set has been generated overnight. Of course, the reconstruction is going to take you know, another day. But you can see now this myelinated axons and all the mitochondria in there, and these black things inside the axon are mitochondria. And then, again, we have automated um, algorithms to be able to do that uh, relatively quickly and then generate data. Now, nothing comes to real data here. So what, what this slide shows is, um, and in the Cooper zone model, again, 12-week model, uh, showing spontaneous remyelination, uh, internodal length, which is, uh, we believe, the most uh, important metric to confirm remyelination. So in control animals, naive animals, the internodal length is approximately you know, 120, 130 microns. And in demyelination, first of all, you see very, very few myelinated axons. And in those myelinated axons, the myelin is, is obviously, you know, the internal nodes are very smaller. Over time, during remyelination, you can see these no internodes are, are getting larger, so which is, you know, the, they're more, more and more wrapping of these axons. So obviously, this is the baseline, and then we can uh, treat them with drugs to test whether or not drugs can modulate this. Similarly, myelin thickness you know, can be done. Uh, you can see that myelin thickness at 12 plus 6 is not a very good metric because 12 plus 6, it almost looks like uh, the naive animal. Again, this will allow us to establish a baseline 
and, and we use this uh, technology to test uh, drugs already. Uh, another quick example in terms of how uh, CDM is useful to evaluate uh, hippocampal neurons. So this is the hippocampal CA1 area. This is a specific area that we enlarge, so the one in the red box in B. So in C it's enlarged, it's reconstructed by animation, looking at um, the, the spines uh, in, in this particular model. So controlled versus demyelinated. So what you can see is that um, the number of spines are actually increased. So these animals, after 12 weeks demyelination, they have twice as many spines. However, the length, volume, and postsynaptic densities in these spines are significantly reduced um, post demyelination. Now, this is the power of this technology and how far we can go in terms of identifying what is going on in, in these animals. Very quickly, as we get to the end, um, ongoing development to uh, validate live imaging. Again, our intent and our goal is to bring up more and more features into these animal models so that they can, you know, we can help with, with the clinical development. Now, these are very interesting modalities because you can potentially uh, develop clinically translatable biomarkers. Um, everybody knows about magnet uh, MRI and, and how widely it's used in MS patients. The idea here is to be able to do longitudinal live imaging to evaluate efficacy in these models and we want to do MRI and PAP correlations. Uh, similarly, with optical coherence tomography, this is already used clinically, and we are now testing those in, in our animal models to see if we can quantify uh, retinal nerve changes and whether or not we can use those changes to modify or modulate those changes in drug studies. Um, a little bit of data with MRI, because we already have preliminary studies going on in Cooper's own model. What we know at this point is using the uh, MTR, the magnetization transfer ratio, in the 12-week treated animal. So on, on the left side here is an image which showing uh, the control uh, with the area highlighted for hippocampus. Um, and, and on the right-hand side is the 12-week demyelinated animal. So what we see after chronic demyelination is 30%, 33% uh, decrease in MTR. Now, this was the first step to evaluate whether or not there are changes. The next step is to do a proof of concept whether or not we can modulate these changes. All right, in summary, I just talked about animal models that recapitulate features of MS. Both EAE and Cooperzone models have several different features. There's no single model, obviously, which has everything. Uh, we do believe reliable and reproducible experimental endpoints are very important to increase the credibility and decrease the late stage failure. It's very good to test neuroprotection, remyelination in both white and gray matter regions. And um, we have advanced techniques such as 3DEM, which can provide us more information uh, about proof of uh, mechanism of action. And hopefully, MRI and ACT, uh, OCT will be very helpful in enhancing the value of these models even further. Thank you. I just want to thank the whole team at Renovo. Again, we have a much bigger team than this. Uh, and Bruce Trapp, of course, who has this vision, is, is a very strong uh, scientists and then keeps our ship very tight in terms of our quality. Um, we, we pride on our quality, the data. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Once again, just want to say that we will be at Ectrim's Actrim's meeting. Uh, uh, we have a booth there. We have a few posters. Uh, so we'll be very happy to meet you there if you're there. If not, we're also at SFN. Uh, we'll be very happy to have uh, more conversations and how we may be able to Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. So you can type your uh, questions in the message box there. All right, uh, I have one question here. What mitochondrial changes do we see um, in EA or Cooper zone model? Um, so, yeah, so we, in both models actually, so we've done a lot more in the Cooper zone. We've done some in EAE as well. Uh, but one uh, change that is very pronounced right after demyelination is increase in the volume of mitochondria and number of mitochondria. So it's this very simple equation, we believe, of, of trying to compensate the damage. Obviously, these 
axons are demyelinated, and so now they have to work more. So generally, in a, in a nice myelinated axon, you see a large stationary mitochondria and then uh, a few um, migratory mitochondria. Uh, it's a very nice distribution of these large ones and smaller ones. Now, when we go to the demyelinated uh, stage, number one, we see um, a lot more mitochondria just in numbers, and we believe it's because of fragmentation of the stationary mitochondria. So basically, they're responding to the energy demands because there's no more myelin now to protect, so the axon is working harder. So we see uh, number going up, volume going up. There is more uh, aggregation of smaller mitochondria, we believe that that's the process of, of forming ovoids, uh, which eventually is a sign of axonal degeneration. Um, and uh, so we can actually quantify all these changes. Uh, we see very similar changes in EAE as well. All right, so uh, another question here. How reliable is your EAE injection? Do you have problems with reproducibility? So uh, our EAE induction rate is um, close to 90%, and it is highly reproducible, I would say, especially with the mock peptide. Uh, we have tried other versions, different models of EAE, but we, uh, we couldn't have the same reproducibility induction rate uh, as, as good as the one that we have right now. So the mock peptide, which is most frequently used right now, uh, the reproducibility is very high, I would say, and then our induction rate is almost 90% in these animals. So um, it's we, we haven't seen a problem so far with that model, the, the mock peptide model. All right, so one more question I have here is, uh, do we quantify activated microglia cells, and then what stains do we use? Um, yeah, so we we can quantify activated microglia, um, and then we use different stains. So obviously we use I, IBA1, which is a pan-microglial marker. It, it shows a shear increase in microglia whether or not they're activated uh, or inactivated. So it's, it's a very good marker to start with. And in terms of uh, specifically targeting activated microglia, we go for F4AT or MAC2. Um, because but in this particular model, uh, we see significant activation of microglia. So it becomes, in fact, you know, if, if we look at just IBA1, we, we see a lot of activated microglia. It becomes extremely difficult to uh, do good quantification. So uh, F4AT or uh, MAC2, they both work very well. And then they clearly demonstrate or show the difference between activated versus non-activated microglia. And um, so that's, that's definitely doable. And uh, obviously, you know, we understand that microglia is, uh, is a great area of interest in, in MS right now, and we do a lot of that. Yeah. Um, another question here is, uh, we quantified the extent of demyelination by using luxol phospho staining as percent of white matter. How reliable is this? Um, Again, I think going back to the, the images that I have with um, the black gold, if you see. So the challenge in white matter, more than staining, I think, is the thickness of the sections. I mean, you have to remember that if you're not in these very thin sections, um, you, even either you use like false blue or you use an antibody, you will not be able to differentiate between healthy myelin versus myelin debris. And that's a big problem, And what, depending on what time point you're looking at. Um, now, if you go later stages of remyelination, maybe there's not as much myelin debris. Uh, but clearly, I showed you 12 plus 3 images uh, in Cooper's own model. You see that in, in uh, EAE models as well. You have myelin debris. And unless you go to these really thin sections where you can differentiate the myelin debris versus active or healthy myelin, it will give you variable and not highly reproducible results. So that would be the big problem with these dyes, LFB, black gold or, or anything else that, that you uh, do. And especially the other problem with dyes is 
I mean, the intensity of staining, especially if you're measuring intensity, you know, it can easily vary, but how, how long, you know, you're leaving the tissues in there. So something that you have to be extremely careful about. Yeah. All right, I think we are um, 45 minutes here. Um, I, we will be very happy to answer any other questions offline. Please send us an email. Um, again, if any of you would like to have a copy of these slides, we'll be happy to provide that as well. Um, once again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we hope that this has been helpful for you. Thank you.